doesn't matter. <coughs> Two charges, Your Worship. One of unlawful imprisonment and one of assault. How does it feel to be famous? Is that what I am? You bumped up from the provincial unsavory to the national celebrated. Franchise made the time this morning. Thank you. Morning, Mr. Blair. I uh, gather you're trying for Kevin McDermott. Yes. Oh, well, faith, as they say, can move mountains. He's a friend, Carly. We were at school together. I can't imagine any KC, even an old Etonian, coming all the way up from London to defend a case he can't possibly win. It was rugby, actually, not him. Unless, of course, you've managed to wangle an all-woman jury for the Assizes. Stan? Petrol? Advice. Don't tell me. You want to sell that heap of junk. <laughs> no, it's nothing to do with the car. What's your trouble, then? I didn't see you in court yesterday. Not well, the franchise again. More bloody slogans. I need a night watchman. The Sharps absolutely refuse to leave the house and move into a hotel. The police can't or won't guard the place after dark. From dusk until dawn, it's absolutely wide open. Tell them I like a room facing south, far away from kitchen noises. You? What's wrong with me? I wasn't asking you to do it. Why not? I just came here to find out if you knew of anyone you could trust. Me? I trust me, all right? <laughs> with a pistol. That's what you want, isn't it? Come on. Yes. I'm sorry to disturb you, Mr. Robert, but I really must ask you to deal with the Henderson estate papers today. Mr. Ramsden left any messages? No, sir. What the hell is he playing at? I'm sure there's no cause for concern, sir. He's supposed to report every day. About the Henderson papers, sir, they should have been seen to last week. Now it's a matter of some urgency. Get Mr. Bennett to sort it out, will you? I'm sure I don't have to remind you, Mr. Robert, Mr. Bennett is the Ham Green Parish Church representing you at the funeral of Lady Mason. I'll be back this afternoon and deal with it then. I'm sorry to have to say this, Mr. Robert, but the failure of our senior partner to attend the funeral of one of our most valued clients is... it's yet another sign of the degeneration this franchise affair has brought upon the offices of Blair, Haywood and Bates. We do have other clients apart from the sharp ladies. Timmy. Miss Tuff and I are very concerned, sir. We feel that you are in danger of losing your sense of proportion by allowing this matter to take precedence over everything else. Particularly since we now must visualize the prospect of failure. Miss, another cup of tea for my friend, please. Cakes. No cakes. Well, I've done the Carina, the Oak in Church Street, the Primrose, the Teapot, even the old Heave Ho down by the canal. I've tried every tea shop, coffee house, and department store in Labra. Now, I truly believe you're wasting your client's money, Mr. Blair. Nobody's seen her. 
Everybody's been talking about this case for weeks. The kids had our face plastered over every rag in the country. They'd have remembered straight off if they'd seen her. I'm beginning to wonder whether she was ever in Larbra. Now, when you've checked the obvious, what you're left with is the rest of the world. Do you happen to know what the white population of the world is, Mr. Blair? Do you happen to know how my feet feel? Yes, Thank you. Imagine beating a poor lamb like that after death. You think they did? The paper says they did. The paper reports that the girl says that they did. But they wouldn't print a story like that if it wasn't true. It'd be more than their life's worth. The blithe spirit. One lodger as promised. Stanley Peters, Miss Sharp. Good evening, Miss Sharp. We're really very grateful, Mr. Peters. I'm off. These clothes are killing me. Thanks for the lunch. You did yourself an injustice when you said you couldn't cook. <laughs> lunch? Thank you for the flowers. You mean you've been here all afternoon? Relax, old chap. I've buried Lady Mason for you. Where do you think I got the flowers from? Play golf with me this week? We'll see. You've been cooped up too long, Mary. Miss Sharp, I think it would be wise to steer clear of Milford for the time being. We could start early before the two rounders have finished their lunch. We'd have the course to ourselves. I'll let you know. I'll see you tomorrow. I'm delighted you'll be able to sleep here. But haven't you got a wife? Not on my own, miss. I think I should warn you, Mr. Peters. There may be reprisals. Once your customers get to know that you're helping those notorious sharp women, they may take their custom elsewhere. Nowhere else to take it, ma'am. Well, there's Mr. Luxton. <laughs> Drunk five nights out of seven. Really? But what about Biggins at Ham Green? Wouldn't know a nut from an acorn. <laughs> I told you I take people as I find them. How did you find Neville? Witty, intelligent? He certainly has brains. Once he starts to use them, he should be an asset to the firm. And he's charming. His mother was Irish. Oh, Robert. Charm isn't a quality I value very highly. Kindness and dependability are much more important. The target was a hundred thousand houses for this town. But though they haven't reached it yet, there's little need to frown. Of fifteen they've completed, only eight have fallen down. And much finding in the marsh, ten to be <laughs> Much finding in the marsh, husband Bosworth. And much finding in the marsh. Tea, Betty. Betty? What's up with her? I'll see you, darling. You've been listening to much fighting in the marsh with Richard Murdoch. You need glasses, dear. What I need is that miracle we've been praying for. What are you reading? Betty Kane's statement. She's been lying. It must be in here. Something we've all missed. My guess is she never set foot inside the franchise until the day the police brought her in. She's been using the place as an alibi to hide the fact that she was up to something else. Well, how did she know so much about the inside of the house? Rose Glynn. The brat who used to work there. It has to be. Can you prove that? What a beautiful night. A bomber's moon. Even if I do prove it, there's still an enormous gap between Betty Kane meeting the Glyn girl in Larbra and Betty Kane coming home three weeks later, covered in blood and bruises, and wearing nothing but a frock and a pair of shoes. I was going to the Gleason's garden party tomorrow. I'll go to St. Matthew's instead and pray a little harder for that miracle. Probably rain anyway. It usually does at the Gleason's garden party. 
Anything for the guineas. Are you interested in racing? Oh, not in the least. I'm interested in horse flesh. Well, I've had a good tip for Bally Boogie. You save your money. None of that Hippocrat's blood was any good when it came to a struggle. If you must bet, put your money on Kaminsky. Kaminsky? Oh, it's his 60s. Well, you can always lose your money at a shorter price. <laughs> Kaminsky, it is. And you're on for a tenth of my stake. I hope this is good news, Mr. Ramsden. You were very non-committal on the telephone. I have something for your consideration that's definitely going to please you. Uh, Mrs. Mulberry, box office manageress of the Palace Picture House in Sutton Street. On at least two occasions, she's seen Betty Kane with a girl answering to Rose Glynn's description. I knew it. They're also seen together at the milk bar and the bus station uh, in the company of several unsavoury-looking youths. Well done, Ramsden. That's not all, Mr. Blair. Betty Kane didn't just come to La Arbor to go to the cinema. Albert, um, this is Mr. Blair, the uh, solicitor we spoke of. I want you to tell him what you told me about the girl. Well, sir, it's like I said, she always came in here late-ish for afternoon tea. Sat by the palm over there. Alone? Well, like she was waiting for someone. What was she wearing? Green, I think, sir. Green frock and a green hat and an awful lot of lipstick. Hat like that? Oh, no, sir. No, 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 sir. No, it was nothing like that. No, no. Um, I've seen this picture, of course, before in the newspapers. But it didn't ring a bell until Mr. Ramsden here suggested that she might... She might look different, hair up and that, no. Yes, that's the same girl, all right, but she was no schoolgirl when she came in here. More like some little madam out on the tiles. Waiting for someone, you say? Uh, yes, but she never met anyone. Not until the day she picked up the chap on the next table. What? You mean he picked her up? No, sir. No, no, no. Don't you believe it? Oh, no, sir. No, no. She did the picking up. Cool as you like. Like she'd been doing it all her life, sir. This man, did, did you know him? And what did he look like? Oh, not one of our regulars. He was youngish, um, business gent, I'd say. You haven't seen him since? Oh, no, sir. No, no. I've not seen either of them since. Well, thank you, Albert. You've been a great help. I may need to talk to you again. Yes, of course. I think this calls for a little celebration. I mean, uh, might I be permitted to buy you a sherry? Oh, thank you very much. Two dry sherries, please, Albert, and keep the change. It's hopeless. How the hell are we going to trace an anonymous businessman who came in here six weeks ago for a cup of tea? He's not hypothetical anymore, Mr. Blair. He exists. He's out there somewhere. And we'll find him. In ten days, five thousand men working for a year might not find him. One man might do it tomorrow. copied from the hotel register for the period in question. The actual value might be negligible, of course, because our Mr. X might not even have been staying at the Midland. It'll take weeks to check all these names. Yeah, and it's quite possible that he and Betty Kane party company that same afternoon and never saw each other again. Well, do you think that's what happened? No, I don't. No, neither do I. They went underground somewhere. I can feel it in my bones. Three weeks? Abroad? Ramsden found no trace of them at the ports. Wait a minute, perhaps they were abroad. After all, we were trying to trace a demure 15-year-old, not some unprincipled little tart covered in makeup. Uh, 
Miss Tuff. The letter you were waiting for, Mr. Robert. Was I right? Yes, I'm afraid you were. Miles Allison, the prosecutor. Opposing counsel like that will make mincemeat of our evidence. Have you heard from Kevin McDermott yet? No. I shall have to go out to town and twist his arm. If anyone can break that girl's story, Kevin McDermott can. You should read this one, my dear. From now on, we should burn everything without opening it, unless we recognize the handwriting. For illiterates, they have a very neat turn of phrase. Robert. Do you realize what time it was when you rang this morning? One o'clock. Mother was furious. Marion, I think I can prove that Betty Kane lied in her statement to the police. Mother, that's marvelous. I need to see the attic again, to be sure. I was right. I've been looking at some press pictures at the front of the house. You can't see this round window in any of them. And that got me thinking, in her statement, she said that from this window she could see the gate, the fountain, and the place where the drive divides. <laughs> you can't see any of them from here. She saw them from the top of a bus. She's never been in this room. <laughs> you should have been a detective. Oh, well, I'm just a boring solicitor with unblemished reputation and high moral principles. My hero. <laughs> Sherry. Oh, I think I'd better go. Perhaps he's decided to stay another night in London. Oh, no, he'd have telephoned if he were going to do that. Why not wait another half an hour? 
I'm sure you must have better things to do on a Saturday evening. <laughs> if you'll excuse me, I'll just hmm? see how my pie is getting on. Ah, here he is now. Steak and kidney pie, I can smell it from here. Mm. Sorry, I'm late. Inspector Hallam's here. Yes, I can see his car. He's been waiting 40 minutes. Sorry. John! Sorry to keep you waiting. Good fishing trip. The best. You landed, Kevin McDermott? Hook, line and sinker. He comes up on Monday. Best bib and tucker? Rotary dinner and I'm late already. This must be business then. It could be. Could be nothing at all. Thought you should know anyway. We've had a message passed down the line from our chaps in Newcastle. A bit garbled, I'm afraid. Foreign gentleman, Danish, called into one of the stations on Thursday. Seemed nobody took him too seriously, so he walked out. All they managed to get out of him before he lost his temper was that he was up there on business, something to do with timber exports, and that it had something to do with the franchise affair. He waved a newspaper cutting under the noses and started shouting about Betty Kane. And that's it? You didn't even get his name? Sorry. And this was Thursday. Good God, he could be anywhere by now. Could even be back in Denmark. I'm off. Margie will be hopping mad. Well, thanks for the information, John. I appreciate it. I'll get on to Newcastle first thing in the morning. Could be clutching at straws. When you're out of your depth, you go for anything. Kaminsky it was. And if the worst comes to the worst and you end up bankrupt, you can always do a fair trade as a tipster. <laughs> I warn you, she cheats. <laughs> so do I. But it's the best cheater wins at this game. What is it? They're all around the house. The line's been cut. What do we do? Oh, no. Miss Sharp. Take these. Give me five minutes, then go for the car. Surely they haven't gone out. The line's dead. Be a saint to keep on at the exchange, will you? I'm going out to the franchise. Robert, take care. Stay there if I were you, laddie! What? Come on! 